Well, good afternoon to you all. I'm David Hollenbach, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to make my presentation to you from a long distance. I am very grateful to uh, Jerry Powers of the CPN, Catholic Peace Building Network, and to Elia Somondi for having invited me to be part of your conference. I deeply regret the fact that I am not present with you in person. This is due, unfortunately, to uh, the airline canceling my reservation without consulting with me. And uh, so you can be sure I will not be flying with Turkish Airways again. So anyway, my presentation for you this, this afternoon is on the issue of nonviolence, justice, and reconciliation in the framework of Catholic social teaching uh, to try to bring some of the ethical and theological ideas about our pursuit of peace, uh, reconciliation, and justice to the fore in your discussions. I regret that I have not been able to hear the previous discussions, and I hope that what I have to say will have some relevance to you. I would begin by pointing out that Catholic teaching on issues of peace is really quite complex and is in fact uh, developing. We have uh, seen in very recent days in the last number of years, uh, maybe the last decade or so, a rising commitment and a rising uh, affirmation of the importance of nonviolence uh, in the Catholic and Christian tradition. Um, there has been a very strong endorsement uh, of nonviolence by Pope Francis. For example, in his 2017 World Day of Peace message, he entitled the message, Nonviolence, a style of politics for peace. And in it, he said, may charity and nonviolence govern how we treat each other as individuals within society and in our international life. And then he went on to say, may nonviolence become the hallmark of our decisions, our relationships, our actions, indeed of political life in all of its form. Uh, there was also an important conference that took place in April of 2016 at the Holy See under the auspices of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And that conference uh, made a rather dramatic statement. It was not officially a statement of the magisterium or the teaching of the church. The conference was jointly sponsored by Pax Christi Internationalis, and in some ways the, the statement issued represents the standpoint of Pax Christi. But they went on to say, we believe there is no just war. They went further and said, we call upon the church we love no longer to teach just war theory. So the question that arises for us today in this complex and developing tradition of the church on peace and nonviolence and justice is whether or not this move toward the abandonment of just war theory uh, is likely to be the future for the church. In my judgment, it is not too likely that that will be the case. Uh, Pope Francis himself, uh, in a message to the conference that took place at the Holy See that made that statement calling for the abandonment of just war theory, himself actually reaffirmed certain legitimate circumstances in which the use of armed force uh, could, be, could be legitimate. Pope Francis stated that in a conflicted world, governments cannot be denied the right to legitimate defense once means of peaceful settlement have been exhausted. Where does this leave us then in this complex and developing tradition? My view is reflecting in some ways the same position that's taken by the US Catholic bishops who affirmed that in situations of conflict, the commitment of the church to nonviolence should lead us to pursue as far as we can the pursuit of justice through nonviolent means. But when sustained attempts at nonviolent action fail to protect the innocent against fundamental injustice, legitimate authorities may be permitted as a last resort to employ limited force to rescue the innocent and to establish justice. The just war tradition then begins 
with a strong presupposition against the use of force, but then goes on to state the conditions again under which this presupposition might be overridden for the sake of preserving the kind of peace that protects human dignity and the fundamental human rights of people. Now, where does that leave us with the relationship between nonviolence and justice? You have received a PowerPoint uh, that I would have been presenting to you along with this talk if I were with you live in Entebbe. But if you were to look at slide eight of the PowerPoint, and we will insert it here uh, in this videotape, you will see a picture of how nonviolence and justice are both contributors to the reality of shalom. Shalom, Hebrew word meaning peace, can also be translated wholeness or completeness or righteousness and political well-being. You will see uh, the, a brief outline of this on your handout as well. Justice and nonviolence are both uh, contributors to the full aspiration of what we seek for society, which is reconciliation, shalom, wholeness, or peace. Now, biblically, there are roots for both a strong commitment to nonviolence in the Christian tradition, and there are also strong commitments in the Bible and in the theology of the church to the pursuit of justice. For example, in, on the commitment to peace, it's well known, of course, that Jesus in his uh, Sermon on the Mount calls upon Christians to love their neighbors but not only their neighbors who are friendly toward them, but even those who are enemies. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, and love your enemies are very strong commitments of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. We also know that Jesus refused to take up arms to defend himself when he was being unjustly led to his own death. And we know that Jesus repeatedly says to the apostles and the disciples, following his resurrection, his central message is, peace be with you. These commitments to peace are very central, very central in the biblical text. At the same time, the Bible is also very strong in showing us that there is a Christian commitment to justice. God is portrayed in the Bible as an agent of justice. For example, if you go to the book of Exodus, a founding document for the whole religion of Israel, you will see there that when God appears to Moses, he turns to Moses and portrays and says that he will lead the people of Israel from a situation of enslavement in Egypt, of oppression, of injustice, and carry them into a promised land flowing with milk and honey. But he goes as far as to say he knows that Pharaoh will not release them unless he is forced to do so. The word is used there. Uh, and so we have the commitment to justice as very much part of the Christian vocation as well. The tension then becomes, how do we put these two commitments to nonviolence and justice together uh, with each other? Um, in the eschatological or fullness of the coming of the reign of God, we have a deep conviction that justice and peace are completely one with each other, that the fullness of justice and the fullness of peace will be achieved together in the messianic age. Psalm 85, for example, describes this messianic age as a time when kindness and truth will embrace, justice and peace will kiss. It's a beautiful image of justice and peace coming together in an embrace, even in a kiss. Uh, that in the, in the fullness of God's reign, both justice and peace are, like, are going to be realized in their fullness. And we know from the liturgical life of the church, for example, from the preface of the Mass for the Feast of Christ the King, which is portraying the fullness of the kingdom of God that is Jesus has promised to us, that that kingdom is described as a kingdom of truth and life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love, and peace. So the reconciliation of justice and peace, of nonviolence and commitment to justice, is part of what we aspire to as we seek to work for the coming of the kingdom of God. 
Now, the problem emerges for Christians in thinking about how to respond to the issues of war in our day is what to do when these two values of nonviolence and justice somehow come into conflict with each other. We seek to achieve them together. We always seek justice nonviolently, but the circumstances sometimes tragically arise uh, when the pursuit of justice cannot be achieved uh, through the coming uh, of nonviolence. And the question then becomes, which of these two values has priority, justice or nonviolence? Uh, and there are two different stands on this question. Uh, one of, and there are several reasons why there are different interpretations of which of these values has more fundamental priority. One of them, as you will see from your handout, has to do with the way we interpret history. How do things work in the world historically? One, one of these interpretations of history is an argument that the fullness of justice can only be achieved nonviolently. There's a famous Mennonite, theolo a Mennonite thinker, pastor, and theologian uh, who uh, uh, has argued, his name was A.J. Musty, an American pastor of the Mennonite tradition. He made the argument, uh, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. He's arguing that achieving this fullness of the kingdom of God has to be through nonviolent steps, one at a time, and that will lead us. And if we use force, we'll create a cycle of violence that will lead to further violence and even greater injustice. That's one way of interpreting how history works. On the other hand, Pope Paul VI uh, argued when he spoke to the United Nations, there is no way to peace except through justice. He, argued, he stated, if you want peace, seek justice. So Paul VI made the statement that justice is, if you will, the way toward peace. And John Paul II, in his 80, 1982 World Day of Peace message, said peace can develop only where the elementary requirements of justice have been safeguarded. So these two different interpretations of how things work historically is at the root of this dis dispute between nonviolence versus just war theory in the Christian tradition. And these two traditions have been operative within the Christian tradition uh, for a long time. A second reason for this is more philosophical, namely an argument that the commitment to nonviolence is certainly a real one for Christians, but the question becomes, is it an absolute commitment or are there any exceptions to it? Is it a, what philosophers and lawyers call, is it a prima facie duty uh, or a duty simply and absolutely? And there are those who would argue that the commandment not to kill is always binding and taking a human life, which happens in lethal use of armed force, is always wrong? Or are there circumstances in which there can be a legitimate ground even for taking a human life to protect others? That's an argument that gets into our philosophical arguments, into our philosophical interpretation of how to understand the ethics of Christianity. And a third reason is theological. There are those who would want to say that Jesus went to the cross rather than to take up arms to defend himself, and that Christians are meant to follow him on the way of the cross, which could mean undergoing even the, uh, the suffering and death due to the violence against one through and the injustice against one. On the other hand, there are other theologians like the well-known, uh, the former, late, the late Methodist theologian Paul Ramsey, who was one of the great theorists of just war of the 20th century, Ramsey argued that the Christian commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself calls on us to come to the defense of an innocent neighbor if an innocent person is being attacked by an unjust or guilty neighbor. And that Ramsey argued that the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself could lead to using armed force as a last resort to defend innocent persons against those who are unjustly attacking them in an armed way. And that he argued that the commandment to love then 
the loved one, loved one's neighbor, is at the root of just war theory. So these are some reasons why this tension between the nonviolent tradition and the just war tradition have long been present in the Christian community. You can see it if you go back from his, through history, you can see it today. Both the ethic of nonviolence and the just war tradition are enacting and bringing to the fore essential elements uh, of what Christian faith is all about and what Christian ethics is all about. Therefore, I would want to argue that both of these stances are needed in the church, that neither of them is able to produce and lead us to the fullness of what shalom promises, but that we have both, we have two sub-traditions within the Christian community and that those two sub-traditions have to be kept alive and working in the church's teaching and church's action today. So, I would like to move now, though, to the consideration of some of the more practical implications of all this. And beginning, though, from what might be called the presupposition against the use of armed force that is operative within both of the sub-traditions that I have just described. We know the commandment, thou shalt not kill, is very central to, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It uh, uh, follows from our fundamental commitment to the rights and the dignity of every person. Respect for the dignity of every person created in the image of God calls for a respect for human life. And therefore, it has opened up for what, uh, what uh, James Turner Johnson, a distinguished historian of the just war ethic, has called the original just war question, the, con the obligation to respect the life of every human being, raises for Thomas Aquinas the, what Johnson calls the original just war question. If you look at St. Thomas Aquinas's treatment of the ethics of warfare, the question that he starts with, and Aquinas always structures his arguments in the Summa Theologiae as a sort of beginning with a question and then him giving a series of answers to the question. The question that Thomas Aquinas begins with way back in the 13th century is, is it always a sin to fight in war? In Latin, utrum bellare semper sit peccatum. Is it always sinful to fight in war? Uh, the presupposition is that it is sinful. But the question that Thomas raises is, is it always sinful? And in setting forward his criteria uh, of the just war tradition, he, he will go on to say, no, it is not always sinful. But the presupposition is that it is unacceptable, unjust. Killing in defense of justice could be justified according to the just war theory only by way of exception to the norm of protecting and respecting human life. Uh, the presupposition against the use of armed force is at the heart of both the theory of nonviolence and also the just war theory itself. Where the just war theory moves in a somewhat different direction is by noting that injustice itself can be a form of violence that people can undergo harm and fundamental violation of their human dignity through injustice, and therefore resisting injustice uh, can, be, uh, can be a legitimate grounds for taking up arms in, as a last resort. This leads then to the criteria for the exceptions to this commitment to nonviolence, and the U.S. bishops have put it this way back in a statement that they issued about a decade or so ago, they said, in situations of conflict, our constant commitment ought to be, as far as possible, to strive for justice through nonviolent means. But when sustained attempts at nonviolent action fail to protect innocence against fundamental injustice, then legitimate political authorities are permitted, as a last resort, to employ limited force to rescue the innocent and to establish justice. Last resort, limited force, uh, only when alternative resources have been, uh, uh, nonviolent means have been exhausted, and so forth. This points to the fact then that just war tradition implies equally unjust war. 
I like to say that we ought to call it the just and unjust war tradition, not the just war tradition, because it does not assume that war is just. It assumes war is unjust. And only by way of exception might it be legitimate. And it sets forth the norms, the just war tradition does, for when that use of force might be legitimate. Just cause, for example, is the, one of the central uh, norms of jus ad bellum. Just cause means defense of innocent persons against injustice. This, in the contemporary context, is the only reason for an exception to the presupposition for nonviolence. The use of force is limited by this norm of only for the purpose of defending innocent people. This rules out all use of force for conquest. It rules out the use of force for re revenge. It rules out the use of force for the expansion of empire. And indeed, it, you, it rules out force for most of the cases where we see war happening in our world today. Another criterion is that it should be war can only be conducted by legitimate authority. This means no private militias, no use of force by private groups, only legitimate governments. This got into a big discussion, of course, in South Africa back in the days of apartheid as to whether or not the apartheid, the white apartheid regime in South Africa could be regarded as a legitimate government. And indeed, the authors of the Kairos document, which advocated significant change in South Africa, wanted to argue that the government of South Africa in the, re in the days of apartheid was not a legitimate government, uh, but it was the resistant forces, the African National Congress and the Pan-African Pan -African Congress and the, the groups that were supporting the movement for black liberation in South Africa were the only legitimate forces there. So they argued that the use of force by the South African government was not an example of legitimate authority uh, using force against black people. Uh, another criterion uh, is proportionality. The use of force should not be such that it leads to disproportionate harm, namely harm that makes the situation worse. If you looked at um, slide 14 on the PowerPoint that you have received and will insert here in my talk, you will see the contemporary outline of the various, various uh, criteria of the just and unjust war tradition, that it should be for a just cause, by legitimate authority, uh, as a last resort, with reasonable hope of success, conducted with right intention, and so forth. So these criteria are criteria for the illegitimacy of force, not just for the legitimacy of force. And then we go into what are known as the jus in bello criteria, the justice for the means that can be used within war. Um, and this will be in slide 15 of your PowerPoint, or we'll insert it now so you can see it. And these are discrimination. Any legitimate use of force, if there is such, has to respect innocent civilians. There can be no direct attack upon innocent civilians. And any civilian loss of life has to be proportionate to the goals, even if it's indirect, uh, the goals of producing greater justice. Now, these norms have some significant relevance for cases in Africa today. For example, the jus ad bellum norm of just cause requires that force be strictly limited to defending innocent persons to their own life, freedom, and security, or to the rights of nations to self-determination and territorial integrity. Conversely, there's a negative duty not to use force aggressively against other peoples, to deny them their political freedom, or to exploit them economically, or because they're culturally different. Violations of these duties are both immoral and because the norms are also built into international law, criminal. A couple of examples of where these norms were violated in Africa that might help think more carefully about this. Force was used in a massively unjust way during the Rwanda genocide. The Tutsi people were innocent. They were attacked. 800,000 of them were killed. 
This was a massive denial of the rights of people who had done nothing, although they are not perfect or they're not per totally morally innocent, they had done nothing political to justify this kind of attack upon them. That's a vast, a significant violation of the jus ad, bell ad bellum norms in the case of the Rwanda genocide. In South Sudan, over the last five years, or since December 2013, a panel of experts has concluded that both the government of South Sudan and the opposition forces in South Sudan, in that terrible conflict that's been going on there now for the last four years, have committed extraordinary acts of cruelty that amount to war crimes, and in some cases, even crimes against humanity. They have innoc attacked innocent people, violating their fundamental human rights, and that this use of force in South Sudan that still goes on today is unjust according to the norms of just and unjust war theory. Because of the mayhem there in South Sudan, by uh, even by 2016, over one and a half million South Sudanese had become internally displaced, and almost a million, perhaps now over a million, have become refugees. These are innocent people who had no ground for being driven from their homes in this way. And the ta strategies and tactics being used on, by both sides in South Sudan have turned South Sudan into a grave humanitarian emergency that's marked by death and massive displacement. Both the commitment to nonviolence and even the standards of just war tradition, just an unjust war tradition, uh, would suggest that these conflicts are unacceptable from an ethical and Catholic social teaching point of view. Another way of looking at the relevance of this tradition of just and unjust war to the, South Af to the African situation is to consider briefly the so-called doctrine of the responsibility to protect. In the aftermath of the genocide in Rwanda, an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty issued a report entitled The Responsibility to Protect. That report's core ideas were endorsed at the UN General Assembly uh, in 2005, when the UN General Assembly at a world summit stated, each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, from war crimes, from ethnic cleansing, and from crimes against humanity. The responsibility to protect people falls first and foremost on their own government. Uh, this uh, whole doctrine, by the way, of the responsibility to protect has deep roots in African scholarship. Uh, Francis Mading Deng, a very distinguished Sudanese uh, scholar and diplomat, uh, authored an essay back uh, some years before the responsibility to protect doctrine emerged called Sovereignty as Responsibility in which Francis Deng argued that the sovereignty of a nation does not mean it has the right to do whatever it wants to its own people. But sovereignty means a, a state has a responsibility to protect its people. That's why it's regarded as sovereign, because it's the agent for the protection of the people of a country. So when the state fails to protect its own people, it loses its sovereignty. It loses its ability to say no one else should come in and interfere with us. And so the doctrine of responsibility to protect begins with the claim that the government of a particular country should be respecting and protecting its own people. But if it fails to do so, the responsibility to protect can flow to the larger international community. Now this idea was supported by Pope Benedict in his speech at the UN in 2008, where he says, that states have the duty to protect their own populations from grave and sustained violations of human rights. This is Pope, Frank, Pope Benedict's words. But if states are unable to guarantee such protection, the international community may intervene with the juridical means provided in the United Nations Charter and other international instruments. So there's a way in which uh, the Catholic social tradition 
affirms the legitimacy of the intervention across a national border if it's the only way to protect people against violations by their own government. Just very recently, in September of this year, just September 25th, Archbishop Paul Gallagher, who is the Vatican, the Holy See Secretary for Relations with States, at a speech he gave at the United Nations, said that this uh, religious leaders, and he meant the church and others, could help society understand that the responsibility to protect is a corollary of the principle of reciprocity, either negatively, namely, do not do unto others what you would not have done to yourself, or positively, do unto others what you want done unto you. So coming to the aid of those who are being violated, Gallagher argues, Archbishop Gallagher argues, is at the heart uh, of the responsibility to protect doctrine. Uh, Archbishop Gallagher went on to stress, however, that the invocation of the responsibility to protect should be always multilateral. Now, this has been subject to heated controversy, this responsibility to protect, especially in Africa. Some in Africa see the responsibility to protect doctrine as a form of neo-imperialism about the uh, Western powers putting themselves in a position to come to uh, intervene in a country like Africa. There are those who would have argued that it is a kind of continuation of the French colonial motto of advancing la civilis, the, the, uh, advancing the, the project, the, la mission civilatrice, the, the civilizing mission uh, uh, of, of neo of imperialists. However, uh, I think an argument can be made that it does not need to be seen that way. Um, the responsibility to protect doctrine has in fact been invoked on several occasions in recent years relevant to Africa that I think indicate that it can have some positive effects on the conflicts and situations in this continent. Following the 2007 disputed elections in Kenya, which 10 years later we're here, you're meeting in, in Entebbe instead of Nairobi because of fear of the possibility of similar conflicts developing after the most recent election in Kenya. But in 2007, uh, after the uh, elections there, major conflicts developed in Kenya especially in the Rift Valley, where all kinds of people were driven from their home. Well over 100,000 people were turned into internally displaced people. Many thousands were killed. Uh, maybe a half a million uh, were internally displaced. And Kofi Annan, who was General Secretary of the United Nations, then said he saw the crisis in, 2000 in Ken uh, 2007 in Kenya through what he called a responsibility to protect prison. This led Kofi Annan to help organize a major diplomatic initiative to try to bring the situation in Kenya to a peaceful conclusion. And there was inter that it became the, the UN became involved in negotiating, the African Union became involved, uh, a number of countries surrounding Kenya became involved, the U European Union, and so forth. There were di intense diplomatic activities that ultimately led to a power sharing agreement between uh, the two forces that were in conflict that brought the conflict that was developing in, in, in Kenya uh, to a, con a peaceful conclusion. It didn't solve all the problems. There's still tribal animosity and division politically, as we saw in the 2017 election. Uh, but at least the situation in Kenya did not fall into a full-scale civil war, which some people thought it was about to do. So this case of the Kenyan situation of responsibility to protect shows that responsibility to protect does not mean in most cases, and shouldn't mean in most cases, military intervention. It can be a call for what uh, the International Commission that developed the idea call for prevention of conflict, finding ways to bring about peace, to build peace, not to just intervene with military force. So the responsibility to protect can overlap very much with the ideas of peace building and, 
and avoiding conflict if possible. So that case is a good example, it seems to me, of how the doctrine of responsibility to protect does not mean some kind of Western military intervention in Africa that has led to some of the fears to, toward that doctrine that has been present. It has, however, the doctrine of responsibility to protect has been invoked to justify the use of military force in Africa. For example, in 2012, France and ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, took military action with UN approval, approval in the pursuit of peace in Mali. And in 2013, the Security Council of the UN supported the use of force by both French and African Union troops to stop atrocities and the displacement of nearly a million people in the Central Africa Republic. You can invoke then, you can point to the Mali and Central Africa Republic cases as examples of where the doctrine of responsibility to protect was invoked to try to bring a conflict to an end. Again, a kind of peacemaking initiative, this time using armed force. Uh, and those cases are not resolved by any means. They're still all kinds of problems in Central African Republic and in Mali, but at least they did not disintegrate into crises that were considerably worse uh, than we had seen before. So I invoke these as examples of how the just and unjust war tradition can have some relevance, both to saying no to situations like what's going on in South Sudan today or what happened in Rwanda, but also saying perhaps yes to certain kinds of peace building initiatives like what took place in Kenya, Central Africa Republic, and Mali. These are relevant, I think, to our consideration of the relation of nonviolence, justice, and uh, reconciliation in the Catholic social tradition and in the African context. Going back, though, to where we began with the primacy of nonviolence. This points to the fact that the primacy of Catholic social teaching on uh, war, nonviolence, and justice is the primacy of a just peace. We are trying to build always a just peace, a peace that is nonviolent, but also includes justice. So finding ways to bring this about is really at the heart of what we are aiming to do in Catholic social thought. This points us then toward some other new thinking that is emerging uh, in discussion of peace building, the building of just peace, of what's now called just post bellum, justice after conflict, how to put a society back together again after conflict has divided it, or what we might call restorative justice. Uh, you will see uh, on the from slide 20, which is uh, on your handout or in your, uh, in your PowerPoint, and we'll put insert here, uh, there are multiple types of justice. And you can see these types of justice also uh, on the last page of your handout. Justice, on the one hand, it can exist between individuals. An, a quid pro quo relationship between people, buying and selling at fair prices, paying people a just wage for their work, and so forth. These are one-on-one -on -one relationships between an individual and another individual, between an employer and an employee. These concepts of justice are sometimes called uh, commutative justice because they, they commute, like someone going back and forth to work each day. They are reciprocal. They are equally back and forth between quid pro quo uh, between two people. However, that's not the whole meaning of justice. Justice is also about building up the common good of the society. We are obligated to make contributions through what can be called contributive justice to the common good of society as a whole. One of those common goods would be protecting the environment. The, the, a, a clean and healthy environment is not a good that's just there for me or you separately, it's there for us together. It's a common good, it's a shared good. And the only way to sustain such a good is to build it up together. 
And then distributive justice enables individuals to share in and participate in that common good. So justice requires building up the common good and requires distributing the common good to individual members of the society so that they all are able uh, to participate in it. Now, one of the problems, if you look uh, at slide uh, 24 on the PowerPoint, uh, which you now insert now, is that war and conflict actually fractures that common good, divides society, and this is an, a profound example of injustice. The division of society, breaking society apart, destroying what on the chart that, that you all see is called social unity and peaceful coexistence, social division and war fragment that kind of unity in society. And one of the calls for justice then, in terms of the way we think about building justice in our society, is to overcome that fragmentation. And if you look at slide 28 on your handout, you will see uh, this is called restorative justice, a form of restoring the unity of society so that society can function in a way that leads to the respect for all of its members. Restorative justice is uh, important because it's, it's different uh, from retributive justice. Retributive justice is like that balancing of the scales. It's a form of commutative justice. It means the punishment and the crime should balance each other. Uh, that's what retributive justice calls for. And this can be, a, can be an issue in conflict. Some, someone who has undertaken to organize a genocide, for example, uh, John Paul uh, Akiyesu in Rwanda, the first person ever convicted of the crime of genocide in Rwanda, was put on trial and convicted. And he was sentenced to life in prison. The penalty was seen as being balanced and suitable uh, for the crime he had committed. This is a form of retributive justice. On the other hand, however, restorative justice is something that the kind of thing that took place, let's say, through the auspices of the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This was an effort not to penalize and send people to prison, but it was an effort to restore the unity of the society that had been so deeply divided by apartheid. Finding a way to bring justice to that society meant not simply taking all the white people who were discriminated against blacks and throwing them in jail. It meant rather restoring unity, social peace, harmony, trying to find ways to move toward that in the South African situation. So that the restorative justice and agenda in South Africa was identified with a finding a way to bring about reconciliation between forces that had been divided from each other. This restorative justice is a crucial component of peace building, of keeping a society that has been in conflict, putting it back together again so that that society, is, that society has less conflict, less division, less injustice because one of the ways in which people are treated unjustly is to be excluded, marginalized, from being able to share uh, in, the, uh, in the social goods of the society, not, able, not having access to the economy, to economic life, not being able to share uh, in the political life by being denied to vote. Any number of other ways of being excluded are part of the injustice that divisions of society can cause. Restorative justice is not just to send people to prison for doing that, but it's trying to find ways to enable those who have been excluded to become full participants. And this means creating institutions that will guarantee the possibility of people coming together and being unified in a harmonious and justly grounded society. An example of this kind of reconciliation that I like to cite followed the Second World War in Europe after the Nazis under Hitler 
had done such tremendous damage by launching the conflict that led to the Second World War, where millions upon millions of people had been killed, six million Jews had been exterminated, and a huge, terrible uh, uh, conflict and event had taken place in Europe. Well, there was a debate in my country, in the United States, uh, between uh, two major advisors to the President of the United States, who at that time was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, there was a man named Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. And he recommended to President Roosevelt that what the United States and the victor, this, this is when it was clear that the Allies, the US and the UK and so forth, were going to win the Second World War, he recommended that what should be done to Germany, because Germany had launched two major conflicts in the 20th century, was that Germany should have its total industrial base destroyed, that Germany should have its entire capacity for building any future weapons eliminated, that Germany should be reduced, Morgenthau said, to the status of an agricultural nation, and all of their industries destroyed by the victorious Allied forces. On the other hand, John Marshall, who was the Secretary of State, recommended something quite different. He said if we want long-term peace, we should be engaged in helping Germany rebuild. This is the beginning of what came to be known as the Marshall Plan. Now, the Marshall Plan had reasons other than that, because it was also worried about the role of the Soviet Union and the role of communism in, East, in Western Europe. But one of the things it did, it launched a rebuilding program in Germany that ultimately led to the uh, creation of the European Union. The collaboration of what took place following World War II was the, were the seeds that generated the European Union and ultimately one of the reasons why I think that the dangers of things like Brexit and the possibility of some other nations of Europe withdrawing from the European Union shows that they have forgotten what, what exactly happened when there was no European Union between the countries of, of Western Europe, the terrible violence and many, many, the war that resulted. The European Union was created as a structure of peace, an institution of restorative justice, an institution of reconciliation. Now, there are other ways we can look at that. That's what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa has attempted to do. There's a long way to go there of making sure that there's adequate uh, economic uh, well, uh, sharing by, by, by blacks and colored people in South Africa. But at least it didn't say the way we'll deal with South Africa's history is to send everybody who was white who can in, participated in this to jail. It, it, uh, it was a way of trying to find a way to put the society back together again. This is what restorative justice and reconciliation are all about. It does not mean restorative justice and reconciliation does not mean that we simply accept injustice. The struggle for in restorative justice to bring everybody involved to respect the rights of all continues. And restorative justice or reconciliation does not mean we should forget the harms that have been done. It's not a forgive and forget model. Rather, it's a model of trying to rebuild and, re and put a society back together again. Call it restorative justice then, and see that as an implication of Catholic social thought for peace building. Another way of thinking about this, and I haven't seen much about this, but I like to talk about it as what might be called creative justice. Restorative justice assumes that there was social unity and harmony in the past. In some places in the world, in some places in Africa, that has not been there. So what we need to do is find ways of creating the institutions that will guarantee peace, harmony, reconciliation, and respect for the dignity of all. This building up of a peaceful, peaceful social structure is a crucial component uh, of how we think uh, about peace and justice in our society. It seems to me that this is the challenge before Catholic universities today. 
to help people recognize not only the limits on the use of armed force, which are very real and very stringent, not only to try to help people understand more deeply what it means to protect the fundamental human rights of all persons, that means a peace-building agenda has to be a human rights agenda, has to be an agenda that looks toward economic justice, trying to build up forms of social participation in both the political and economic sphere. But then finally, the agenda of Catholic universities in their peace building programs and their peace education programs has to be to focus upon the institutions of social life, of good governance, uh, of economic justice in society, where those who are being excluded by elites have an can get an access in more effective ways to the, to the share of the, of the economic resources that are so essential. The, uh, the, the peace building agenda, in other words, involves uh, human rights and justice just as much as it does a commitment to nonviolence. These are the challenges before us today, and I hope my presentation to you has been somewhat stimulating to your own future thinking. I wish I had been present among you to engage in uh, the earlier dialogues you've had, but I hope that this presentation has helped you think further about what the issues of nonviolence, justice, and reconciliation in the framework of Catholic social thought might mean for you in your further discussions. Thank you very much.